this computer. Sounds good. Okay, so just a quick suggestion how I think it would be ideal, like for me and maybe Matthias have some ideas. So what I like to see if Camille would be kind enough to demonstrate <laughs> some sort of, you know, rails and go interaction. So not much into workhorse itself, but how we let's handle some requests from rails, no matter which, let's add some additional stuff and just channel it to the workhorse and just accept it and see how we could, let's say, check it manually. What I'm mostly interested in, how to like locally debug this stuff, how to check the things are working. So I don't know, maybe we could do it on Camille's machine in GCK because in GDK, I know how to do in this in GDK. I think it's not that elegant because I need to make project every time manually. Just to understand, you, you are referring to the um, send URL stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we could I that. think it would be ideal to see some like example of this interaction between Rails and Go and how to check this interaction locally. Yep. So I think Camille, we have what, this already, actually. But yeah, Camille, go ahead. I'm I'm kind of thinking like what actually to do because like send URL uh, it like proxying data and like it's like something that is already implemented. Uh, I'm just kind of wondering. I mean, I, I thought we had said in the last call that we start super, super simple, forget about image proxying. Uh, and instead what we would do is, uh, and I know this wouldn't be production ready, but we just implement a command in place as being just forking up another process which will resize an image that you give it. You know, something really simple. <laughs> just <laughs> replace it start with. with some placeholder. Yeah, yeah start. exactly. Not even resize, so we could even serve one on one yeah, because, pixel. Because that way we can keep it focused, you know, it would just be in workhorse and it doesn't have to be production scale or whatever, but just something to get started with. And we can maybe iterate over this, you know, make it, yeah, behave more sensibly <laughs> yeah, as, we, as we move along. Let me think a little like how to approach it. So maybe like let's let's write a like a, a, like this kind of uh, workhorse command that would do like image resize, and let's try to hook it like the whole stack, and let's see like if we can do it like in like next one or two hours. I would assume this is something that like you would spend. Does it sound okay. like okay? Perfect. Perfect. Who is going to do it? It's me or you, Alexi? Uh, I don't know. Maybe you may be better because you will have like tools in place so you wouldn't waste your time like dealing with some stuff. So we will conceptually just do stuff. Because okay. I will spend a lot of time on setup and something will broke in the middle. Okay, so let me... So it's it's not principle for us how to like run a GCK, GDK, whatever. It's like quite simple, similar from what I've seen. In GDK, you just rehook another executable into the go path and just rebuild it in place. In GCK, you mentioned that it rebuilds it automatically. So, I I mean this is how like GCK works, right? Uh, yep. It's it's kind of kind of number like quite complex if you want to interactively debug the process, but it's possible. Uh, so, I mean like for, but like if you want to like restart that always, it's pretty convenient. Sorry, my UB key is misbehaving. Just give me a few moments. Loading, another one. Um, just one, like while you're doing that, Camille, Alexei, 
I think mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you need GCK for anything. Like uh, you can just that's the nice thing about Go. I already realized it's quite easy to get started with it. The Go toolchain uh, is really nice and streamlined. If you go to the workhorse folder, wherever it might be, you can just say make build, and it will yeah, drop yeah. a binary in your local. Is it, is that what so I actually uh, do with GDK? I just run make and it, then it doesn't I, have anything to do with GDK or GCK. It's just like that is like just make, like calling Go directly. So you can. Yeah, yeah. In anywhere. GDK, you just need to replace the proc file. I mean, to edit it a bit, in you replacing the starting point for about, for, for, uh, for the binary. So oh, it's you simple. mean? Oh, uh, I see. Okay, so if you wanna, you mean if you wanna spin up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's wanna hook up everything in place. Yeah, sure. But what I'm saying is, so, like, it will build a binary. You could just start by running a machine. Yep. So, Alex, like, maybe I'm, what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna like, I'm not gonna write this like external command because like it's fairly easy to move that into external command. Mm -hmm. But kind of like write this handler internally, similar to like send data and send URL. Okay. Okay. It's like, yep. it should be quite simpler, but maybe we would achieve the same effect quicker. Yep. So, um, what I could use really, send you around. How do you navigate the structure of this project? So you know that these are handlers. How do you know that? I mean, what's the best way to learn that I'm, these I'm are handlers? Kind of, I'm kind of remember that this is the handler. Like okay. If we start, I kind of remember that this is like handler. Uh, sorry, the send URL because like if you look, for example, in the here workhorse, um, there is like a bunch of the methods that provide like support for different handlers, like send mm -hmm. API, uh, send URL, send artifacts entry, and all of that are pretty much handlers. Okay. So I'm kind of thinking that this is decider. Let's remove that. Let's remove that. The entry param. And these handlers, you hook them up in routes.go. Is that correct? Yes. And does every handler have to, there's this uh, data structure called proxy. Does this every, okay, so every URL that Workhouse handles itself um, that goes in one proxy, uh, yeah, so in a separate proxy, and then any other URL uh, goes into this catch-all proxy, right? Mm, so, like, I, I believe, like, if, if the handler is not found, it would pretty much be, like, the, some kind of error in processing, because you would not pass that further into mm, stuff. Okay. I'm kind of, like, thinking what would be that's interesting. We just that. This is either. What we probably what we don't need. There is this, this head the HTTP transport. It may be needed. Prometheus. We may not need that at that moment. This is also Prometheus. Okay. So we have the inject and. This is probably like the main processing that we need. And so inject is the hook where we we get called or we, we receive the headers from Rails. We get invoked and then we do our thing and then we render out a new response to the client, right? So um, params and like we, we get this inject and like we receive a params. Uh, and what, what's in the params? It's like JSON string, I think, so realized. Okay. Or, or something like that. I, I don't remember exactly params data. Uh, so image resizer, unpack params data. Uh, logging, we can remove that. Params path null. Maybe we need some method like to read the data. So, are these handlers being uh, chained 
or are they like separate and everyone act independently? So either one or another one? I, I, I think like uh, they are not tight. So like okay. you, you can only have like a single handler really. So okay. if, you, if you would have the image resizer, you would probably have to replicate a lot of uh, stuff. But, mm -hmm. uh, I'm kind of copying a bunch of data. Yeah, and where did you define the name of the handler? Because I see you named the file accordingly, but where is the Ah, uh, okay, so I have see. A, have, a look, have a look at browits.go. I think this is where all this happens. Ah, okay. Uh, and, and, and it looks like, so it calls this create routes method or function. And I, I, uh, sorry, I, 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 I need to exactly figure out how like this handler like is hooked, but probably it's pretty much like a single flat list of the handlers to process. Yeah, so it, it has a list of route entries and then when it boots up, uh, sorry, when it gets a request, it will just find the first match. So it will, it will just walk through that list, everything. That's what it looks okay. like. Okay, okay. Probably we need to read the file if this is the case. If this is URL, probably we need to request the file, which is HTTP client get. It's very unsafe. Mm -hmm. And probably we have response and error. So error is near, we read to error. And now response, we should always close the body. And now we should check status code. HTTP status, okay. In such case, we should read on all to his body. Otherwise, near. Ah, it's actually it's. I mean, in, in like handling requests and responses, it's like there is like a set of the good practices really to do, which is like you need to consume the whole body in order to have the request keep alive. Uh, properly working, so usually what you do, it's like you write kind of this defer block, and the defer block are executed in the order they are defined when you exit the function, so they kind of like serve as a final clause, really. It kind of ensures that like if you consume the all data, this request is going to be uh, cleanly closed, which is not always granted. and. Error. No. It would be better to use the error app. Okay. And let's put some information. So, and it will be Q will be up. We start to. Could you call this handler alone in in some console or I mean, mean some some dynamic environment? I wonder what is the fastest way to check this this you on the piece of the code. You can write a unit test and it it just sits next to the source file. You just mm. call that function for the byte array. Okay. 
because for example while i will be writing similar code i want to constantly run it in in the smallest possible let's say uh context so image resize go long yeah i mean yeah i'm just wondering if it would even be possible to you know prototype it outside of workhorse first because the basic stuff is not dependent on workhorse at all you know if we start with something simple like resizing an image you know I think we might need, I, I looked at this API, Kamel. I didn't find any like resizing functionality. There was like stuff like give me a rec, you know, a rectangular area of um, pixels, but that in itself isn't really useful. Oh, there you go. There's a module. Okay. And there is some like some, some uh, user library, library for that. Right. Okay. So um, maybe let's do it. Functional. Maybe for now we just replace it with some like proxy image with something super stupid. Image, I believe it's image error. So and what is actually the code? The code config. Ah, it's actually like redone. Cool. So, okay, so by new buffer because we have buffer. If this is error, I might be another image. I have a go question actually, because this was something I was wondering about. Um, this short circuiting code where you nest all these functions and all of them can return an error. Um, and so you want to change this error return behavior, right? So every function you look at has kind of like a, if error, like all this boilerplate, you know, if error is not nil, return nil error. It doesn't do anything, it just returns the error again, right? Is, is there like a idiom and go to, so you don't have to do this? This no. is a, this is a lot and go for some reason, such short is, circuiting. This is a, a, like, there is some ongoing discussions maybe, but this is one of the idioms of using Go that you have very explicit error handling. Mm -hmm. And you explicitly acknowledge that you ignore some errors. This is why you don't have exceptions you, you never use that you kind of uh, retool this error manually it's like like it's kind of like very obvious how you handle each error but it's uh, common to write like tons of returns, right? During the function. So every time there is a chance of error, you're checking for it and return immediately, right? I, I mean, like it depends really like how you want to handle that error. It could be maybe ignoring that. Like for example, in my case, I'm kind of like, if I see error on the effect, I'm gonna try PNG and so on and so on. Mm. So. It really depends like how you want to handle the error. I'm kind of there was some it is SVG, we use SVG. It did work us to grow a little. <laughs> speaking speaking of growing it, would it be a concern if we were to add a new dependency to it? Or is that like, is workhorse <clears throat> light enough as it is? I have no idea. Probably you would have to really ask uh, people responsible, showing them yeah. like them minimally if this is acceptable or not. Probably it would be, but like, I, I cannot really like guarantee you. Just, just a nitpick, does it make sense to re like change places of PNG decode and JPEG decode, knowing that PNGs are most common again against the images we have. 
So we will have, let's say, a smaller rate of the errors in your logic. I, I have no idea. Really. Mm, okay. I, think, I think we can probably it, ignore it, the details. It, it, it's like, not gonna so probably you would have to check exactly which one is faster. Or maybe mm -hmm. like even in the entry params explicitly specify a format. Okay. So I, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, Alexi. I don't know. <laughs> Let's see if we have error. Uh, we still have 500 capture and fail. We don't really want to capture and fail. Let's lock an error. Sure. So we can write header, we start to okay, and we can write data. It's unsafe, like doing that that way. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And return. So we have the image. Do we have to close the image? Sorry, what do you mean with as we don't check the result? I I mean like you mean it I could mean be something that's not image data. data? I mean, ideally, this like oh, written okay. out of the device that right. like got written and like error it could be off because the like, client could be closing connection early and things like that. So it's mm -hmm. it's very good like to ensure that like you handle that error. And for example, like go like GitLab Runner adopted um, like this principle that if you want to skip the error. And like this returns like two values. Like this is how you acknowledge that you skip these values, that you do not mm. care about the return value. So it's it kind of like it's then explicit um, and deliberate skipping of the values returned by this function. Uh, this is for example how runner does that. And we may need that library. Oh, actually, I mean, uh, maybe useful to specify the image. Do, don't you have to require this in the module file or something? It's, it's not sufficient to just put it in the import clause, isn't it? No, like like you need to still import like the the vendor dependency, and there is like a something named go mode mm. for managing like the dependencies. And like we would then load these uh, dependencies. So it's a really interesting it, dependency me mechanism, the whole source based, you know, just download and recompile it. It's mm -hmm. kind of nice because it, I, I, I have no idea how it would work in like a large project. It might be messy, but it's nice to get started because then you don't have to learn a whole other system just to get started with a project. You know, how like in Java, you have to like learn Maven or Gradle or you know all these different build systems to even have basic dependency management. It's kind of nice that Go has that baked in. So this is like the way to use enums somehow. Image. Yeah, JPEG. Otherwise, we do error. Uh, what I did wrong here? What What is IOTA? Um, it's automated sequencing number. Hmm. I, I don't know what is this acronym exactly means. I never. Oh, is that the C function? <laughs> it's, the, it's not that. <laughs> it's like, 
It's very present of the successive integer constraints. That is, uh, so yeah, I like, think it gives you an integer array, right? So like this, these uh, points we have like um, consequently numbers hmm. inside. Interesting. Mm. Also, we may need to use workhorse to make so. I may want to. I think I, I never really use go mode. So let's see. Go mode. What What are you trying to do? To install dependencies. I can and actually. Then. I use. I don't think you need to. I think you just build it and it pulls it down. Yeah, but I think it, we use this tool, right? Go mod, which is like separate dependency yeah. management. No? So go mod is just a tool for dependency management we use in Workhorse, right? Mm -hmm. If I tell okay. it will be a certain aspect ratio preserving value. It's cool. So it's pretty nice. Library because I can only I need to only specify with, then I specify method, and then I specify size, resize it, image, and does it return? Not really. Always resize the images, image. So now I can really like encode that. We're gonna encode this image and it's gonna be our HTTP response, resize that image, and not gonna look or we're gonna care about the error. So helper log error. What is our variable single letter? Request. Ah, it's it. Ah, oh, okay. I see. It was like before. It's the, it's the legacy of the terse C programmers. <laughs> single letter, single letter variables. Well, uh, if uh, functional programmers also like this idea, like from mm -hmm. the function perspective, you know. I, I think it's okay when it's clear from the context what you know what it is when i look at some like a b c d e <laughs> yeah that's horrible because that's this color no stuff i was like oh my god i mean even r is not great because is it the request or the response <laughs> so we have um some processor so we probably image besides uh, Oh, we need compile. Go mod. So, sorry, what is this go mod tool then? What does it do? It's it's for managing dependencies. It it strictly versions them because like in the past, go run could not have management of the dependencies, so you would always fetch latest default branch. Oh wow! Okay. So, okay. so, so they, the, they introduced like the build in. There was like a number of different um, apps for managing dependencies, mm -hmm. but it introduced like the go mod, which is a built in, and kind of like strictly links the version that you are compiling against. Mm -hmm. And That's it's good. kind of like very close to gem file, really. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, I mean, gem file is really like your source code, it's implicit yeah. as long as you define that. 
Mm -hmm. But Gen 5 log is really like the go mode. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Cool. So, is it actually reading? Not really. Not yet reading. And if I do well, it's pop. I defined image. Cannot use the image as a type. Ah, because this is the interface and interface is always uh, the object origin. So we don't have to. And cannot use params with because the type is wind. So let's check. Let's change the wind. Um, not enough arguments to call. Okay, there is options. And in the end code options, you can just get me out. Just pass me. So I read some weird stuff about nil references if you have an interface type. I'm not sure I understand it correctly. So if you have a nil reference to an interface, um, mm -hmm. is it, did I understand correctly that you can call methods on it and it will just not do anything? Like it does not raise like a the reference exception or anything? No. It's no what? No, like you cannot call. You cannot do it. Okay. No, it's not, it's not Objective-C. In, right. in Objective-C, yeah. yeah. no you, you could send a message yeah. on, on the null object and it would be ignored. Okay. Cool. Uh, in the script, they like introduced type checking, so you kind of have to explicitly mark if you accept this to be null or not null, but not in the go. go. Like, if you want to send, <coughs> sorry, if you want to execute a function on the object, it always has to be present. Interface is like some representation of the, ma sorry, some mapping of the object, really. Like, it's like, uh, you don't explicitly declare that the given object implements interface. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's the tricky part. Like in other languages, you explicitly declare that. that yeah, it's more like type classes than uh, that your object implements interface, not in the Go. This is uh, proving somehow sometimes hard. If you use objects across different modules, then you have to like to trick the Go rank into creating like this kind of static inside validation that your object can be mapped to the interface if you do like dynamic mapping later mm -hmm. uh, outside your, your module. So this is it. Uh, what we need here, like we only need like another method, like image resize, right? Mm -hmm. Path and width. So the params is path and width. Send data header, and here we have image resize. Image resizer. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I need some image to resize. Also look at the logs of the controller that I'm calling and I also have to run migrations. Let's run migrations. Okay. So it should be migrated, it should be able to be loaded.
I'm looking for some image. Um, so actually, this is like some some image, right? That I could use. Ah, it's actually from the gravatar. You could take my avatar, for example, or any, you know, image from the internet. I'm just gonna use that one. What's so the original size? So since we haven't touched whales yet, how are you gonna? How are you gonna do this? You're just gonna curl workhorse with these headers that the Rails app would otherwise send to trigger that code path? Or how, how would you do this? I, I need to figure out exactly how this image is being fetched and from where. I, I need to figure out exact controller and basically I need some image assigned. And now if I have the image, I should be able to find out exactly um, where this image, like by which controller is being handled. And it's actually, is it actually like right now, it's the avatar, so it's, it's not upload. Hmm. Let's try again. So the profile pic. Are you, are you trying to find out where it's being served from? I'm, I'm yes, I'm actually like trying to ensure that there is like the image that is being handled by Peter. Uh, that, but it's fine, like it returns avatar. I mean, yeah, maybe because it's the default image. Uh, you can use um, the, if you go to the issue that we had open, you can use um, Alexei's avatar. <laughs> I also use that for a bunch of testing. <clears throat> and I, I looked at like how it's handled in the app already. There's like a mix in called upload actions. And this handles these kind of requests. And then there's a couple of different controllers that mix that in. Like projects. Like, like, like anything like, that has an avatar, I guess, mixes that in and probably other things. Like, like an image. It doesn't really matter what it's. No, it doesn't matter. An image. Ah, OK. I, I, I forgot to click update profile settings. I assume yeah. that if I, that if I do this choose file, it's going to be enough. OK. multi handler has been very good. OK. And I also have to like reload GitHub. multi handler has been removed. So while that's loading, Alexei, how do you feel about, uh, so if, if we get this to work, just a minimal thing, um, what do you think is the next step? Because to be totally frank, I, I was kind of hoping that what Camille has done so far, like we would do this. <laughs> because I think that would have been a great exercise, you know, to get our hands dirty and some go related stuff. So I'm just wondering, like, what, what are we hoping to get out of today, mostly? Mm. I, I, I mean, like for me, I think the best way to learn is, is just to do it a bit myself. And I might be like 50 times slower than Camille at it, but I, I kind of want to avoid like that Camille is writing a whole pack for us <laughs> because I think that would be a nice exercise for us to do. Yeah. So, 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 so um, um, I, I think like it's, if we still have like the open topic of the image proxy or something to integrate as a separate service really that is not part of the of the workhorse to figure out if you really want to do it or not and probably like we actually have like three different approaches to that problem and we need to pick one of those which is like maybe something that is similar to mine uh, maybe something that is like executing separate commands uh, and like the third approach would be like integrating image proxy so like something like a separate service or like the fourth one, static resizing, or like maybe even like ignoring workhorse completely and like doing like maybe like specifying completely external service to do image resizing. 
So um, I, I think Matthias, like you're not gonna run out of the work to, to try out <laughs> yet. Yeah, I was just like talking about the dynamic one. So because yeah. last time we chatted, we said we want to do that one first, and then we would pair on it. I mean, I'm happy to choose a different approach, but maybe we should then kind of decide <laughs> what we want to do first, right? Like, because if I work on the static one, which would just be a Ruby app, it's probably not useful for me to spend my time, you know, uh, working on Go and Workhorse. Okay, so I have this image being, I'm having this image loading, and it's actually loading through Upload Controller Show. And it seems to be like loading through this uh, generic upload controller. This top level, and this is like find model. But it actually does. There is an action show. There's no action show. Uploads actions. And here we have action show. And we have sent upload. And we have content disposition. So probably we need to hack this somehow. So let's maybe hack this params with if we have the params with. it work? Also this left set upload. And cool. So this is the code path. And we have file uploader. Probably we need to do something like that. And like fall back to this other case. So workhorse, uh, direct params. Let's ignore that. I don't think that this is needed. We probably need not century, but image resize. But you mentioned the workhorse. Is it still possible to run any other service inside the workhorse which would like be persistent during the whole workhorse life cycle? Or is it like we are breaking the pattern of the whole workhorse? So if I, we have some. I, I, I think it would be possible, but probably you would have to ensure that the workhorse team is fine with that approach. Like yeah. Because like I, I mean like like you can do anything really as long as you control like the resources being used. But really my question is like is like the uh, workhorse team fine with that approach? That like we're gonna run some sibling uh, process somewhere. And but just to make clear, we are we are trying to bundle it into workhorse because we are afraid that it would be too much cost to introduce a separate service. How I could understand that cost? Because, I mean, I understand that, like, we need to change this whole, probably, deploying scheme. But 
how much is it i, I mean like like you, you you talk about money or like you talk about time uh, because because like about... the cost is really like development you need to update like number of the components like omnibus you need to update cloud native oh is that precise i guess there's also some overlap for the users right because they need to deal with another service definition in omnibus that needs to be I'm, I'm surprised it actually it seems to work <laughs> nice. on the first try <laughs> on the first try without a unit test <laughs> it's pretty without <good>. unit test <laughs> I'm, I'm, let me check. Is it actually like really precise? With it said 150 then. 150. Yeah. 1,000. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Ship it, Camille. Ship it. <laughs> Done. <laughs> it does precise in motion. So maybe like we ship it, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, but I mean, you put this library, is it like random library or do you know something about it? I mean, is there some sort of audit we need to do over this kind of library? Because I'm not sure, I understand how we audit gems, but I don't know, like two years ago, the last change, right? Ah, okay. It's like, it's pretty bad library to use. I just picked the first one from the internet. Okay. It's like at the resize function. Yeah, it says not, not no longer updated. So maybe yeah, I just need to add that one. Please look but, for but other like, alternatives if that bothers you, Alexi. I think, I think Alexi, okay. that's that's probably the smallest of our problems is to find find a library that can resize images. There's also always yeah. the option of um, because Go, I'm sure. I mean, I haven't looked into it, but I would suspect it can call into C code as well. So there's a ton of like native libraries like Image Magic and all these usual suspects that do much, much more than, <laughs> actually, I think image magic is probably a terrible example because it's so big and does so many things. It will probably be way too heavy. But um, yeah, I, I think we'll figure that out. Okay, does, but- like, the integration work in Go, Camille? Is, is it fairly easy to call into something like native? Uh, sorry, can you ask again the question? Sorry, um, is it fairly easy to integrate uh, native code like shared libraries into Go? Like, is it easy to call something pre compiled like a shared library from Go? Is that possible at all? You don't really want to do it. Like, uh, Go allows you to call C functions, but it's also kind of against Go. Yeah, yeah sure. But I'm, I, I think because, for like. Because, because like Go. Uh, they actually like rewrote pretty much <laughs> majority of the or the integration with the system to be nat natively written in the Go mm. because of the much better control over memory and execution. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. But like, I'm, I'm just thinking. I mean, because image processing is something that's been like fairly complete for a few decades, probably, and so there's a couple really well proven, battle tested libraries already for this. So I'm just wondering, there could be a safe option just for just purely to, you know, he, he, yes. he's a bitmap, you know, make it smaller. Uh, so just for this portion, it's probably not a big deal to like. Um, I, I know that there is like, I, I saw like a number of libraries uh, written in the Go. Hmm. Uh, yeah, we, would, we can look at that first. Yeah. That, that would be like, uh, this is like another one really. Seems like but, even better maintained. That like that some of them really like integrated native. Um, oh yeah. Okay. The like C libraries that like were for for significantly longer. Yeah, and for those we definitely need to check the extra memory footprint. Because yeah, I, I want to remember like Image Magic. I think it's pretty large, for instance. Yeah, and I like, I wonder, do we have any control over CPU and memory usage over a particular handler? Is, does Workhorse has any mechanism how we could like limit it? Because you know we are doing pretty beefy operation on this handler. So well, I guess how we could to project check. like really large images, right? So that we don't have to create the maps in memory that are you know hundreds of megabytes. It would be nice to have it dynamically because to check that 
image is not specifically you know decoded encoded so it's kind of small but resizing would require you know tons of resources so it would be nice to have some limits over which we just drop the operation and fall back so um like like go like the process doesn't allow you to control like on so so small level this is, I mean, this is why maybe running separate processes may be better because in the worst case, if your process go outside of some limit, you could really like kill the process and restart it again. Uh, because like, like take a look, like, like, I mean, image resizing is not really that like complex. I mean, it's not like, it's fairly memory uh, demanding because like in order to store uh, 1k by 1k usually need four bytes for lgba this is usually like how all the images are being encoded you need four megabytes of the memory mm. and i like, need another buffer uh, to the output image but like since we are mostly like resizing to something very small so probably it's not really like a big of the concern uh, but to camille do you know how these like resizes work is there any way to stream something that is compressed or would I have to create a bitmap first fully in memory, make it smaller, and then re-encode it? Mm. Yeah, because really, the bitmap data is what, what we should be scared of, right? Not the image size on disk, which is I, I, I mean, like, data on the image is, like, encoded rows by row, by row, by row, by row, by row. But usually, like, usually how you resize, like, you get the like some pixel of that block, or like you calculate the average from that block because like mm. you bring that image in all dimensions. Right. You don't so there needs to be at least some look ahead or something. So like it's not that like you can stream and reject every second. Yeah. yeah. Because like you need to from the block of four four by four, you need to pick uh, one which is like uh, nearest neighbor. Mm. Like here, it's like you get the average from all of that and like. Uh, the one that are neighbor for you. Yeah. Uh, there are like other me like mechanisms that are uh, providing much better quality. I don't know exactly like um, what they do. Uh, yeah, and they result in different quality, right? So it's probably also something that we shouldn't just decide, just purely decide on technical limitations, but maybe the design team <laughs> wants to have a say in that as well. Yep. It was definitely uh, concerning the issue that Dimitri raised. Uh, was it Dimitri? Like someone raised it. Uh, Dimitri, yeah. Yeah, because they said even even now, if you if you downscale it in the browser, if you let the rendering engine do it, there's noticeable like jagginess in the in the image, and they 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 don't like that. So, so yes. Yeah. So 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 th this was also my suggestion that like there are concerns related to the performance, we really like and how how aggressively can we scale or like in what buckets and like also what algorithm we can use that like gives us like the best uh, resource usage to like to the quality. And I don't really know like which one is the best when running on the scale, like and how computers on run intensity is that. But it's like, for example, like this library, like it gives you uh, four different algorithms from the simplest one to pretty like sophisticated to probably taking uh, like some kind of like goes on filter or something i don't know uh, but I, I don't really know exactly how cpu intensive are there and like, yeah we, we can well, uh, that's the stuff we can profile right that's what you want to do uh, but maybe it's really like it's really not the peak of the deal uh, i mean we, we can just profile that later on um mm -hmm. That, that should be pretty right. easy to do. Try on production, really, like, let's enable this one for like for yeah. 15 minutes and see the CPU. Right. So, see it's a problem or not a problem. Yeah. So, Alexi, I'm actually beginning to think that um, I, I like Camille's point earlier. I think we should maybe talk to the workhorse team or someone from infrastructure, I guess, and get their thoughts on the general approach here as well before we spend, spend like days or like a week on writing a POC and then finding. Just like totally like this would never even be deployed, you know, because it's just architecturally not a good decision. Like I really like Camille's point around the process isolation because 
you probably don't want to put a workhorse worker at risk by letting it do like this image heavy stuff. Um, so maybe we yep. can float but a couple ideas to um, other people as well and see if they think what what is even a good point to start with, with this. Because other, otherwise we might just be wasting time. What I like to know process isolation we mean not even running it inside workhorse right or we could somehow isolate well, process could be and go from workhorse but ah, okay. would not run the same process at risk okay as i see the current worker because i don't know so so, so 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 like so like probably the, the, like two approaches really like you can run another process that is running all the time but like you, you use some kind of i don't know rpc type of connection yeah um or like you can do what we do with the cmd is gitlab zip cut so they like we just like run on the demand but then the question is like what is really like the latency for these different approaches like yeah. because like probably like the one that i prototyped i would assume that like if it was run um like this another process running constantly, it would be pretty similar for the latency, because like you have persistent process that like you don't have to spin up each time. Um, but if you would have like another process that you would like uh, exec into, uh, how it would behave during, mm -hmm. like what would be the latency? So what I'm really saying like that, maybe this POC could uh, help us really to try to better measure like the latencies resizes memory usage if it would be part of the like uh, workhorse or maybe separate processes maybe you could we really, like move that into the fork process like github cmd type and see like how it would be performed then or it, like maybe it doesn't make any difference uh, so but uh what you mentioned, one of the options is to, to run process side by side, right, with workhorse. But to do this, we need some, you know, some health checking mechanisms. Do we even have them workhorse? Because I believe if we don't, it will be a huge like over price to implement them. Because we need to make sure the process is up and running all the time and handle the failures and stuff. So so, 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 so maybe this is like the POC to implement to see exactly how much effort it takes to have this kind of process running. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, like, I think at I this have... point we could probably benefit from having this like outlined a bit more structured, like what the different ideas are, because there's a lot of yep. ideas. So let's far. guess through them. Yeah, because even if we, if we have a POC, I don't think you want to go to the infrastructure team and tell them, "Oh, I wrote some code," you know. Does it make sense? I think it will be way easier for them if you present them like three different options and like the problems we see or you know where you know what could be a lot of work, um, kind of the pros and cons, and then that might be easier to talk about. So, so as you see, like this approach in that form, it's fairly easy. It has a bunch of the downside because like you cannot control strictly resources, but like it's pretty clean, like as what implementers. It actually works after. 45 minutes on the call as a POC. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and it, it's great that it's that it's simple. You know, honestly, like the memory pressure issue for if we if we would do it in process, I think for avatars wouldn't even be a big deal because avatars are pretty small. I mean, we looked at the analysis, right? And we don't even get that many requests. So, um, so, but, so but for content images, it might be very different, right? Because they can be very large. I, I mean, like, but I mean, maybe it's really like, uh, step by step, maybe it's like we adapt that model that I POC, yeah. but we define that we resize images that are no larger than, let's say, 200 by 200. Exactly, exactly, like, because like, we, we like, said like, for like, the MVC like, it is avatars only anyway. Like we can mm -hmm. read the header of the image, like PNG, JPG, and see like yeah. how much memory it's going to use. Like, exactly. But it's yeah. very easy to recycle, it's very cheap to re like resize that later. Yeah. And like we initially just resize uh, like not these big images, but later like we just in the next iteration have like much better control over memory. Right. No, I, I think that's a that's a that's a great point. And uh, because we we already said you know uh, we will focus on avatars first, and that actually gives us um, 
some runway, right? Because they, they're much easier to deal with. They're very small. Uh, and yeah. I look at the breakdown, remember, like there's, most of them are PNGs. They're very small. Like if we downsize, downscale them to the, the all the extra sizes we need are smaller than the base size, which is like 200K or something, uh, which in PNG is like 50, 50 kilobytes or something. So if we downsize them to these like 15 pixel images, they're like three kilobytes or something. So we're really talking about really minuscule amounts of, of memory. And, and if, if, you know, if, if we then say, um, well, we want content images as well, you know, then we might have to go back and say, well, okay, well, with the system we've built so far, it, it does not scale safely to these sort of images. So now we need to start thinking about maybe breaking it out to a separate process. But, yeah, but, but, but running but, it in but, a... So but like, the, like there is another like thing to consider. If you maybe want to resize content images that really escapes your like lower boundary that you have, you just kind of switch to the forking model and you execute external command. Yeah, which gives you much better control because like you may not care for like for these small images. You want to be as efficient because of the rates. Yeah, and like there is no really like the possibility that someone would uh, like consume a ton of memory and like just by right like you want to be as efficient but these content images they are not so frequent yeah and they are significantly bigger that like we could just like execute external commands to resize that image mm -hmm. if, if it, you like it, go it, when over you say external kind of do, and do you mean uh, external as in content images could be ha uh, handled totally differently like for instance as by a psychic job up front or do you mean that maybe on the, they're also dynamic, but uh, if we find an image is too large, uh, we, we can actually maybe even use the same resizing code, but it would execute in a different way. It would not be in process, but we might spawn. Like, 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 like you could fire another short living processes, right, for resizing this big image to ensure that you can quickly recycle the memory and it would not affect memory. But, but you mean by workhorse, right? So by workhorse. workhorse right. Work so kind, of, so kind of switch between like one style versus another right. really. and like maybe it could be even be defined by the size of the image to resize which would be like simpler and it could be if the image is larger than let's like, say i mean the source let's say 50 kilobytes you kind of switch into separate processes yeah i mean internally you may still execute the same code from the same code base but it would be like external tool that you execute right. for this big mm -hmm. uh, image to resize and maybe this architecture is like still simple mm. uh, but kind of gives you like uh, like both of the both worlds if you have big images it takes longer time uh, so you may use this forking because forking can cost like five milliseconds but since image like resizes let's say in the 30 milliseconds or 20 it's not a big deal really anymore but if you have like the small avatar, which is like a file of the 10k kilobytes, it's it's wasteful to fork. Yep. So mm -hmm. you kind of have the fast path really for the small images because you know that they cannot consume a ton of memory. Right. And honestly, like maybe maybe we find that once we tackle content images, maybe we do it totally differently. Maybe maybe for the large images, we actually do it statically. That's still an option, you know. Because, the, because maybe we just say only small images that are safe to convert quickly, we do on the fly. And like for, for you know, all these images that are in like comments and stuff that don't get loaded very frequently anyway, it's only when someone actually brings up that issue and looks at that comment. Maybe those we just scale down when users upload them, you know, or in, in like psychic jobs or something. I, I don't know, I'm just saying that might also be an option then. I, what I like about this is then we would completely remove that problem and or make it a separate problem <laughs> you know that we can have a solution for that makes sense in that context and then here we can just focus on uh, the problem at hand which is which is avatars yeah um cool so alexei do you, do you think that would make sense as a next step is to just like I, I, I would personally like to see this written down somewhere, like these three or whatever approaches that have been floated so yes. far, because it's, yes. it, there's like no, I, I think like, I really liked, um, was that, uh, I think, so for action cable, um, 
I, I, this might be a good reference for how, for how the company has been doing it in the past. I really liked how they went about this. I mean, it, it's like it was raised a couple of years ago. So I think on and off, there was like some time spent on it. And then there was like a year of radio silence. But uh, mm -hmm. the way, I like the way the, how they brought it up. Like they presented the different options in separate issues, each with the pros and cons. And then at the end, there was a decision being made about like, we're going to do this because X and Z and Y. Um, I really like that yes. it's documented somewhere and we can see like why did we make the decision at the time and we can say in there well for now we're focusing on avatars and you know that's why we think this is the simplest and fastest way to do it and then then we can send the, i don't know what's a good way to float this maybe in yeah we need to definitely with people who are involved in writing these systems like workhorse but maybe also with infrastructure see what they think for instance, I haven't even heard like what what uh, uh, what their thoughts are on something like image proxy. You know, adding a new service, and then Joshua said, "Oh, you know, this camo thing. We haven't even looked at that." So uh, mm -hmm. and that came out of infrastructure. So they probably have an opinion on this stuff. I would I would make sure to not just go ahead and build something without asking them. If that makes sense. Yep. I I That's... mean like like another approach is really like. Do not do any image resizing by us and kind of like fall back on using some external service. You just configure for right where this service is and it could be like image proxy running somewhere and it could be like this uploads controller uh, preparing like the address to serve the data and like authenticate the request and like you would just send URE uh, of the workhorse to proxy the data um, from that service. So, but that's not safe, right? I mean, not uh, that safe because we don't have any control. And I, I have no idea. You mean some external services? You mean external companies are providing this service, or you mean external service deployed by us? I, I mean, like it could be like an image proxy. Image proxy has like this very uh, specific format if you use of the URL that it's going to perform the size of anything. Mm -hmm. So, so maybe like, like we just rely on, on that. Like you just provide a, how to construct that URL that's going to be sent as a handler to workers in the send URE and the worker is going to request the data from the, this kind of like external service to the workers. It could be image proxy running somewhere in our infrastructure that's gonna perform this like resize for us. What What is tricky for me, like in such options that for example, with your prototype, it's quite easy to estimate the costs, right? Like we're running the same amount of machines, same amount of processes and so on. We just increase latency a bit and maybe some CPU load. But if you're talking about some external service, I don't know how to understand how many boxes do we need to run this image proxy, let's but say. We don't need to need this right now, right? Um, I, mean, I would I first know. like clarify if that's even an option because maybe the answer is also, no, we don't want to run the service. But I thought that when we estimate when the option, we want what Josh like asked us to fetch, like le increased latency and what is the price? And price for mm -hmm. me is a complete mystery if it's something more complex than, you know, inserting mm -hmm. into existing process because I don't know how many instances. Probably we should ask infrastructure for such estimations. Uh, yeah, that's why this Camille POC is very, let's say, looks very simple and very attractive because it's, I mean, it's I don't a know super this, simple model, I don't right? Know if this yeah. Sorry, just about your question. So the way we ended up doing it with Action Cable is. Mm -hmm. to say um, we do the simplest thing first and we deploy it and measure it in production. So that's Sounds good. what we ended up doing. But to, in order to do that, you need to still decide if that's even an option, right? Yep. So in, in, in this case, the embedded mode was, was an option. It was not ideal, but like, it was the same problem, right? We had no idea how this or that thing would perform in production. So I guess it can make sense to start with the simplest thing first. But if there's a reason why they, why anyone would say, you know, oh, like that's a total no-go, I still think that's important to consider. 
then if we will present this option to infra and uh, workers uh, folks and they will agree that this is the option we could just wrap it into feature flags and replace the library to something more stable and just ship it and really check the like feature flag group increase cpu pressure increase memory and just make a decision because it seems fairly simple if nobody is against yeah. it I also think it would be good to like more clearly state somewhere what what the benefits would be of image proxy because it has a bunch of features but I'm just wondering do we even need those you know like how how much how much of this would we have to replicate if we if we write our own image resizing project you know? especially considering if we just focus on a certain subclass of images you know like avatars in this case I mean I started to think that image proxy is ex uh, especially cool if you don't have anything like workhorse because yeah i mean it's example. like a separate because layer a being <laughs> implemented for you yeah but yeah. we have this workhorse and it makes things yeah. easier at the same time so we already have mm -hmm. this control level at our like schema so maybe that's why it's a bit of sort of overkill even to integrate image proxy because it has similar bits this proxy <laughs> to what workhorse handles and handles in a safe way, in a controlled way. I don't know. Yeah, Let's outline this, yeah. this uh, like uh, options, implementation options. Let's maybe uh, tag some folks who may give an opinion. And yeah. if everyone is okay with this simple POC, maybe let's prep it into feature flags, try to ship it. What can you implement it today? Right, so, like, uh, <laughs> I, the, 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 the answer that I would be looking at for is like um, how it affects like the um, workforce work in the long run. Like, memory, CPU uh, is like, because, like, I mean, historically, if you look at different systems, like image processing. Uh, it's one of these items that also is like kind of secure <laughs> as well. <laughs> like the, 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 there may be some toolbacks in there that could be used for the uh, generic some denial of service and things like that. So, uh, I, but I then, my question. yes, then it depends on the tool. I mean, the answer to your question, like explicitly because different libraries will give different answers and so 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 like i, I guess like i would try better understand like uh, how it actually works and what what implications it has on the process really uh, or like what what uh, how we could do it differently, which is kind of like goes down to like what Matthias was saying about like different approaches. So maybe like starting with documenting different approaches uh, is like a good way because maybe it would, you could then like think about this simple approach and document all the possible upgrade paths that gonna like resolve all concerns really. Mm -hmm. so, so like, so like we know that this is works in that way today. We know that this is maybe something that is so optimal. But if we do this, like it's gonna be like beautiful and like it's not gonna cause like it's gonna scale infinitely. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm kind of thinking about like kind of building a mind map from this POC. And how like this, like the very simple approach can be um, taken into next level really to make it like highly scalable, uh, GitLab ready, on-prem ready, easy to manage solution for image resizing. If we, so like when we really need to do it, because maybe we don't need to do it today, but like it's good to have like very clear plan what things would have to be changed in order to achieve that and maybe like these things are easy to change. And if they are easy to change, this proposal would be then probably good to have as an MVC of something to test uh, uh, 
uh, but like we could have always like the open path to to improve that further. If it's I think really it's good. a great way to look at it. And you, what what kind of plays in our favor with this as well is that it almost seems like every step we take towards this will be will very likely be an improvement, right? Because currently we always send down these big images. So if we even if we have a path where we only do like even if it's just thirty percent, sixty percent of the traffic that we handle and make it faster by downscaling images, we can always fall back to the default mode, which is to just serve the image as is. That will still be, even if we do this only you know, half of the time, it will still be better than what we have now. So, um, yep. so, so I think, I, I like that because that always gives you options, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so exactly. So we can look for the simplest thing and then think about the what ifs, <laughs> you know, uh, kind of the missing pieces and what might happen and then kind of outline, this is what we have to do um, as the next steps. Um, and that will probably give some idea of like how much work that will be. And it will help us like not being painted against the wall, you know, if that should ever happen, you know, in like a year or two, we turn around and see, oh shit, <laughs> we didn't think about that. So now what? So yeah, keep keeping doors open, I guess. I, I, I mean, to be fair, like for that kind of like solution, if it's integrated into workforce or is it something external, it doesn't make really a lot of difference. Like uh, how we integrate that in the race, it's like the race part can always be like changed to do something different, really, if it's dynamic. The question is really who it's gonna do this like heavy work of precising. It's mm -hmm. gonna be work or it's gonna be another processes. As long as you have this kind of infrastructure that is controlled by the race, like who really does that? It's really like secondary. It's like a matter of like personal preference and choice and like basing that on the data. Like who does that in the end? What process is those? Is it like separate process? It's like it's the same process as workhorse? Is it children? Or maybe it's like it's completely separate service. Um, I kind of feel like it's like secondary and it's really based on like how we see like the performance uh, of that solution versus quality. Maybe it turns out that like in order to achieve the good quality on the big images, like dynamic resizing, it's never gonna work because it's gonna take you one second to resize the image to have a good quality. I, I have no idea, I, I didn't really check like the, uh, like, what happens if someone uploads 10, 10 megabytes of the image? How long it takes us to resize that image? Is it like you want you want to always do that dynamically? Uh, or like we kind of do optimization of the image on the upload, but then like we use this optimi optimized form that we resize? Um, I have no idea. Like pro probably the question is like how Google does that? Probably they, um, upload the image in the row, but usually people don't need images in the row. They use that in some kind of like lower quality that is good enough. And maybe they work on this like second tier image later because it's fine for them. So uh, there are a number of like ways to approach it. It's like, uh, I think like dynamic resizing is convenient, definitely for like for the small to medium sizes. I just I'm sure exactly how performant is that on the medium sizes, because like on the large sizes, like you can do resizing the Photoshop and you're gonna have like quite good sense on like how long it's gonna take to have a decent quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Alexey again for image proxy, I think. I think the decision to use or not use image proxy is pretty much so all of all of the if we look at what it does for us right like half of what half of the functionality it offers is being a proxy which workhorse does already yeah um, yeah, yeah. And the other half I, I'm just saying half right but not exactly half maybe but like a bunch of the other features uh, that are not related to it being a proxy we can just look at and then say do we want them so badly that we pay for the overhead, and it is overhead, to maintain yeah, right, right. and add a new omnibus service that is this totally own separate thing, right? Because it just yep. adds another layer as well. Um, 
And you know, just looking at just browsing through the stuff, it has like new relic integration, but we're not using new relic, so that's already something we don't need, right? Mm -hmm. It has a bunch of other mm -hmm. things that do sound useful and that we would probably have to replicate, like Prometheus metrics. That sounds pretty easy to replicate because we kind of have all we, we have like um, go go what is it called go kit or, or our get that go kit. Um, it has logging. <laughs> it's pretty easy to replicate. Um, it has like something like um, uh, related to web, WebP and like a bunch of formats that might be useful, but I'm not sure. Like SVG, for instance. I don't know if we need that or want that. That might be something we could actually float back to uh, the front end team or, or Tim at least and ask do you think you know, this is something yep. we foresee. I watching. think what I want to understand better is security measures. It yeah, takes it, exactly. Because yes. it's uh, quite important and probably there is a quite nice outline this library. I also so, heard from Dmitry this libvps. He also used it even before image proxy was released. He used it and he found it really fast. Maybe we could search for a Go uh, like uh, packages with the same library at heart. Yeah, that right. exactly. Use it. Um, but yeah, about security, if, if you look at the listed features of image proxy and click on security, it takes you to the configuration page. And like half of the stuff is what we just talked about. Like it, it's stuff like maximum resolution of the image, maximum file size. I mean, that stuff is pretty easy to implement, right? I mean, this is something we can easily do ourselves. Um, and it's it not really one to avatars, right? Exactly. Maybe it's not even necessary for avatars. Because, because for avatars, avatars, we already have limitations built in I mean, on upload. Yeah. So right, and there's, there's like a bunch of other things like allowed sources. It, it's not relevant for us because the, the image request, the reset request will, be, will come from our app from like Rails. So I, I don't know, like, I'm not saying like all of this is useless, but like there's probably a bunch of things we just don't need. Um, and, and then we can, maybe we can make a list of what would actually be useful or what would we have to re-implement ourselves and kind of then pit that against, you know, how much work would that be and make it mm -hmm. native to a workhorse versus using the slightly larger ready kind of off the shelf, you know, image proxy thing. Uh, but then we have to kind of pay the cost of it being more complex as well and running it as a separate service and I, I can't answer this question. I have no idea. Like we would just have to float this and see what people think. Yep. So so like image proxy like they do a lot of that stuff because they are like full fledged solution for image resizing that you can run on the internet and have like the proper like authorization of that operation. And uh, you can run that against like external service. Free. You, you can really treat that as external service that is not associated with your service. And, like you can use it, redirect clients to use that service directly. So uh, from that perspective, we probably need like uh, image resizing is like 30 percent, uh, like one part of the like the whole. Image yeah, code. exactly. Because and, it also does like, a bunch like, of things like, we already like, do. And like we may be using right. like this most important aspect, but like we don't really need anything else because we, yeah. uh, as you said, we have workhorse yeah. that provides right. that all of that. And we have Rails right. in front of it. It authenticates requests. It already pre-signs uh, a URL for an image download. Uh, image proxy can't do that because it doesn't have access to our business logic. So it has its own support to add an S3 backend. So it can do all this stuff. But um, mm -hmm. and we, we could use that as well, but that's just then, we then need to also configure another service to know about S3 credentials and stuff. Um, when we already have an avenue for this, right? Which is to let the request go through Rails and then you send your help. So, yeah. So I, I, I think like from my POC, I would be interested to understand if you would use like completely external tool to do this resizing, what would be the impact on the latency? Because like 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 you have image resizing right now in the most ideal scenario, like you're never gonna have better scenario than like the current one. But now if you would have to like to approach memory and like much stricter control of the resources, you would have to like to run another process either side by side or like 
exec into another process to perform this uh, expensive resize. What will be the impact on the latency? And is it that acceptable? Because right now, like it's ideal. Like if you, you cannot get better than this unless you start serving data in the static way, like pre-compute. So what maybe um, I need to drop off soon, but um, can we maybe we, we need to kind of condense this to a number, like maybe let's say no more than three versions of this, because right now we are already talking about dynamic scaling, but um, maybe we can ask, or like we, we write an outline and the three options that we present are do it dynamically in process, in workhorse, uh, but restrict it to um, uh, be memory safe. Uh, the second option could be uh, fork off into a separate process for each image scaling request and then let it handle by whether it's another tool or our own implementation, we can, we can, that's like just another sub option, I guess. We could fork we do like, for I, what's that? one process for all scaling requests, for example, which may be yeah, safer that would be the than, option, is to have a yeah. kind of a sidecar to workhorse. Yep. Um, well, actually, that would be then four already, <laughs> because we also have the separate service option. So I guess that's actually four approaches. Yeah, four. I don't know if we can condense this more, actually. Maybe it will have to be four. So, well, so there, there is fifth, uh, Camille mentioned, like to have a completely separate service or else just channels. No, that's what I meant. That's number four. Ah, OK. Yeah. So separate service, separate process. Uh, 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 <laughs> so separate, con like a sidecar, you know, like a perpetual process. Uh, uh, separate process, but uh, spawns and dies with every request. So lifetime is bound to a request. And the first one was just in band, just do it. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I mean, would it make sense like to use my POC to like for you to work concurrently on trying option number two and number three? And like when you have like these three options kind of running, you could really measure and compare like different metrics for different images, how it behaves. This, this, this could this would give you like some some idea about like memory usage, GPU usage, uh, latency, and like the complexity of implementing that. Because I, I think like there is a, an associated complexity with the sidecar approach, but I personally don't know exactly how much it's gonna take us to do it. So it could be really like in, interesting to see if we could do it quickly. Mm -hmm. like, the most naive way, most hacky, maybe not even like completely workhorse way, but to do it quickly mm -hmm. to really like measure and understand how much effort it, it, it would take. Yeah. I mean, taking into account like we have this scheduled for the fighting point three, it would be nice if you would ship something, <laughs> but like it's quite it's quite challenging really. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe Alexei, you and I can catch up and see how we can break this up. Uh, I mean, yep. clearly there's sure. some overlap, like because some of these options will all require <clears throat> some kind of functionality to resize images <laughs> that is that does not live in a separate service. Um, so we need to figure out whether, or, or we could just pair on that initial bit of code. And then once that's done, it can actually be reused by some of these other POCs. And then we can maybe async that out okay. for, for it. Let's do this. I think, I think whatever. Soon. Yeah. Tomorrow I still, morning. I still think or... it wouldn't hurt to like start throwing these ideas in a document somewhere, uh, so that okay. they don't get lost. Because I think some of them have been floated already, and otherwise we'll just keep coming up and. Just create a, just create separate issues for different approaches. Yeah. I, I would propose that it's probably like better uh, to have them mm -hmm. as separate issues. Mm -hmm. do, do you want to create the drafts for these, LXA, and I can fix up some as well and help flesh these out? Yep, yep. And then we can split up the POC work as well. Okay, I will create these issues. Cool. I got to drop up, uh, but thank you. That was that was super. Thank you, fun. Camille. Yeah, it was insightful. And thank you, Matthias. See you soon. Likewise. See you soon.